What Jim's doing right now, as you can see, he's marked out the, the iliac crest. He's making a mark there in the mid-axillary line. Uh, and you want to be just above that iliac crest. You really want to feel for it and you want to go just above it. You can't be right on it because then your port's going to torque on it. Because remember that that is the camera arm and it's going to be kind of flattening out to be able to see the kidney. So you got to go a little bit above that. So he's going to make his incision there. And you don't want to make this incision too big either because you don't want it to leak. So just make it the size of your finger. Jim's got big fingers, so it's probably a big incision. So you can see here he's just kind of getting through the initial layer down to the fascial layer. And then he's going to pop through with a tonsil. You can use a tonsil, a Kelly, a hemostat, whatever you want. But it is tough enough that you're not going to get your finger through it. So he's popping through with the tonsil, and then he's going to stick his finger down there. And usually there's more than one layer. You want to get all the way down until you feel that loose fat. It's like fat that just gives. There's like no fibrous nothing to it. It should really feel like just fat. Otherwise, you're not in yet. So keep going down there. And then once he gets in the space, he's going to put his balloon dilator in. And um, as Jim mentioned, you know, a couple years ago, I wasn't doing retroperitoneal partials. I hated them because I had tried it on the SI and I was miserable not being able to get the fourth arm. And once we got the XI a few years ago, I've started doing them. And now I, I just really love it. I look for excuses to do it. Uh, and it's, you know, saved my butt a couple times where patients just had terribly hostile abdomen. You know, for example, I had one last month where the lady literally, I could get one port in and I couldn't see anywhere to put any other ports. So I said, all right, we're doing this retro. And it wasn't even a posterior tumor. We just said, hey. We're going retro, and it saved me. Otherwise, I literally wouldn't have been able to do the partial. Those of us that still have the SI. So, yeah, if you have the SI, the challenge, as Jim was saying, you can do it. It's doable, but it's really hard to get the fourth arm in. And without the fourth arm to hold the kidney up, you kind of feel like you're working upside down the whole time because the kidney's falling down on you. So if you can squeeze in the fourth arm, you've got to make more space getting the perineum off. If you can squeeze in the fourth arm and get it in, you might get more collisions, but it's, it's really valuable. I mean, you have to have the fourth arm in or you're gonna struggle. You know, Jim probably can do it without the fourth arm, but I couldn't really give up. Okay, we got it now. I rebooted it. It was working yesterday. All right, we can hear you now, Jim. Hello, hello. I'm sorry. Can you hear me? We can hear you, yes, absolutely. All right, great. So we tested yesterday, but it clearly didn't matter. It's all right. We're back. The, the gremlins weren't there yesterday. They're only here today. But no problem. We got you. We're ready. All right. So it looks like you're ready to put your balloon in to do your balloon dilation. Yeah, we're about ready. Uh, first of all, I just want to say, uh, I want to acknowledge everybody in the room here. We've got... Um, we got our team, our normal team. So I have Brandon right across me. Here's Brandon. Terry, my scrub. We have Jeff and Mark, the circulators. Steve is our clinical engineer. <laughs> We're laughing. And then Mimi, Mimi Stone, Dr. Stone's our anesthesiologist. So um, I want to thank everybody for being here. So as you just pointed out, Ronnie, I made an incision right above the iliac crest. And I think the key about this incision is that, especially on the right side, where the kidney's lower, a lot of people talk about using the 12th rib and the 11th rib and moving up here. The problem is then you're right on top of the kidney and your robotic arms are straight up and down and it's just not as good an angle. Now the XI allows that because the XI does have the ability to go backwards on itself and I'm going to show you why that's important. But um, in most cases you want to be as low as possible so that you're approaching the, you know, you can get to the lower pole. So the lower pole tumors on the right are actually the hardest because of where we are. And so I always want to cheat back as close to the that crest as possible. That's what we found to be important. So, um, anyway, I make my incision. a little lower. Okay. Well, can they turn the volume down on this? You want to turn that down? I think it's your voice. Okay. I think the mic might be rubbing up against your mask, too, because we're getting a little bit of static from it. Okay, is it, is it too loud? It, no, it's fine now. Turn it's it, fine now. Turn it down. Okay, well, I'll, I'll talk very sl softly then. All right, so we've created enough space to get the balloon in. So now I'm going to bring the balloon in place. And as I mentioned, we want this oriented towards, towards my assistant, those two, those two. And then I'm going to take the, the robotic port, because this is an 8 millimeter camera. This is a 30 lens we're using for this part of the case. So, so we transition to the zero lens for the case. We'll use 30 for the submissions. Let's go, hold on, hold on, Brando. Endoscopic view now, please. Endoscopic view, Steve. So we're going to show you the inside, what it looks like when it unfurls. Because there's some important landmarks here. 
and, 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 thank you. All right, so, go ahead, Brando. So here's the balloon, we're inside, we've got a 30 down lens right now. Go ahead, go ahead. So the first thing you see is the psoas. There's psoas. And you can see the, 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 the folds kind of coming out of it, but no, hold on a second, Brando. This white line here you see coming off the psoas, that's the posterior gyrotus fascia. That's actually being pushed off the psoas muscle. So this is an important landmark because this is the space we're going to enter to get into the kidney. Go ahead, Brando. Brando's counting. Here it is again. There's the uh, there's gyrotus fascia being pushed off the psoas. So I'm looking up towards the kidney now. So that's a very distinct line. Keep going, doctor. Yeah, and it's important to note, too, that even on the fattest of patients, you're going to see this anatomy. If you just see yellow all the way around, then you may not be in the right space, so don't dilate it. The other landmark we'd like to see, if we can, is the peritoneum coming off the transverse abdominis. So there's a little fold right there. It's very subtle, but that's where the peritoneum meets the transverse abdominis, right there. Let's go some more, Randall. Keep going, doctor. Keep going. That's fine, doctor. That's fine. Let's go with that. All right, so we're just going to let this sit here. We get a little bleeding sometimes. We're just going to let this tampon out a little bit. And so I'm looking up towards the kidney now. Here's the body wall here. Body wall I'm touching right here. And then you come across and you can look down into the pelvis. Okay, this is the balloon down in the pelvis. You can see it's got a you know, thin peritoneum. The bowel's just on the other side of that, so we have to be careful. If you make a hole in the peritoneum, that's what a lot of people ask, what do you do? What I do is I make the hole extremely large, and then I put my fourth arm instrument, basically transperitoneally, bring the progress through that hole, and then use it to hold the kidney and the peritoneum back. And, and that's actually how we started using the fourth arm with the SIs. When we made holes, we would, we would bring the fourth arm in, because we had enough space to do it, and that helped. Go ahead, Brandon, give me a couple more. I want to see if we can get this peritoneum off, or if we can at least show it. Keep going, doctor. Keep going, keep going, keep going. Yeah, it's a distinct, it's not very distinct, but it's right about there. Keep going, doctor, right there. That's good, that's good. Let's go with that. All right. So that's our space. We've got gonadal right there, ureter, you can see kind of moving right there. And that, we're actually pushing it to the aorta. You can see the aorta pulsation there. Cave is going to be right here, cave is flattened out. So we're going to come out with the balloon now. All right. Go to the external view. Let's go to the external view. Okay. So if we go back to the external view, so this is the Hassan I was telling you about, and uh, this is what we're going to use for our first port, and I think it works great. There's an adjustment here on the Hassan. You can make it deeper or you can make it shallower, and that makes a difference. So remember, this is a small space, so if you've got it in like that, you might be in too far, and that, what that does is it decreases your field of view. So I pull this back just to, you know, what, and we do this inside the body, and I'll show you that how we do that. It's a little trick, but we do this inside, so we, we do it inside the body so that we have the maximum field of view with this with port. Putting it in initially, I'm just going to kind of go somewhere in the middle here. So we're going to put it through our, she's got some thick, Obliques, she's pretty athletic, I believe, for a nurse. Ouch. She, she, I think she does a lot of yoga. Um, can I have a, let's have the CO2, please. Is that a 40? 40. Jim, our, our nurses in Ohio all look like that. They're all very fit. Yep. Okay, so we're going to put our CO2 here, uh, see, put the CO2 in here through this port first. And again, 30 degree lens. And here we are without a balloon. So you can see the solace is now back up in our face. And there's Gerota's fascia right there. You want to go back inside? Uh, yeah, let's go back inside. And then we got this, we're going to have to start right here, Brando. Yep, okay. All right, so we're back inside now. Of course, I have a little dot. So the first port I'm going to put in is the posterior port. And we may need to make that a little deeper. I think what we're getting into, yeah, let's do that. Hold this. So I'm going to make this just a, a, a smidge deeper so that we are OK getting by that stuff. Perfect. OK. 
There we go. Okay. Oh, hello. I got the... Yeah, there's, stu there's stuff inside the cannula. Yeah. Good. Okay. So, we're going to look at the posterior body wall here, right there, Brando. Just hold there. And I'm going to bring my, I'm going to make my, my posterior incision here. Nice. So, Jim, um, John is asking, is there a limitation to how much you can blow up that balloon? Because you told us uh, in the lecture that you do like 50, 60 pumps. Is there is my tonsil. So, again, I like to use a tonsil just to show me where things are going to come through. And I like to go underneath the 12th rib and try to avoid. The reason I like to do this on direct vision, you know, some people will put a finger in here and do this digitally. I used to do that. That's actually the way I was trained when I learned this in Germany when I did retroperitoneal surgery. The problem is you, you sometimes don't see the subcostal artery in vein, and so I've hit that a couple times, and that can be a real problem. Gosh, okay, let's get another clean, please. Jim, are you hearing Actually, this? Let's do this, too. Uh, take this. So we're gonna put the CO2 on this other port now. I think once he sits at the robot, he'll be able to hear us. So, so we'll we don't get all that spray, good. All right, and Terry, I might need you to come over here and help. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we've got 30 down. I'm going to turn it upside down, and now I'm going to start with my instrument here, and we're going to start pushing off. I'm just going to start to see where things are. And what I'm starting to see is the transverse abdominal muscle here. Terry, why don't you hold the scope for me? Hold that port, Brando. I'm going to pull back. Perfect. Perfect. And I'm just going to start pushing off here. And there's peritoneum right there. That, that's the peritoneum right there. You'd like not to put a hole in that. Go to the right, Terry, if you can, best you can. Good. So this is the fat I was talking to you about. This is the fat outside Gerota's fascia. This is the PARA nephric fat. Let's go over here. Let's go to the left. Nice. We've got a little vessel there. Give me a, a scissor. And let's get ready with cautery. You get these little perforators here, which are probably better. Go ahead. Dealt with. You want to be external or internal? Are we internal yet? Yep. I want to be internal. All right. I'm doing all this stuff and they're not seeing it. That'd be terrible. Another vessel. Go ahead. I mean, this is this taking us a little time to take these little perforators. Actually, is nice because it does just makes your field so much nicer. You you, you know you can you can blow through those, but then it's just dripping down on you the whole time. So if you just take a little extra time. It's probably better for your vision in the long run. Okay, all right, let's have a stick back. Actually, let me get that off, Brando, right there. Connery, go ahead, best you can. I'm gonna pull this back a tiny bit. Stop, stop, stop. Brando, let me have it a little bit. I'm gonna pull back a tiny bit so we can get to that. Okay, perfect, go ahead now. Yeah, that's it, that's it. Go ahead, go ahead. Oh yeah, nice. So you do have to do a little work sometimes right next to the camera. That's not a problem. Okay, let's have the stick back. So the stick is nice because it's just blunt. And as I mentioned, you have to... Uh, really? Okay. Pop trader. Got this, Terry. I got it. So one thing I recommend well, for this little is difficulty a here, my point backed out a little bit more so than I wanted it to. It's just a straight stick. It's a laparoscopic instrument. It's a straight stick. Okay. It's a little cotton tip on the end of it. It's really nice for this thing. It's it, you're not going to make a hole you know, right, popping Terry, a hole in. Back here now. But it, it has a little cotton at the tip, so you can kind of twist it a little bit and kind of pull the tissue off. You use that. So what I'm doing now, I'm down in the lower retroperitoneum, and I'm just making space for my assistant now. My assistant's going to need, and you can and you can see you can get a lot of distance here if you need it. That's it, Terry. That's nice. Back, come in a little bit, Terry. There you go, perfect. Okay, so now we're going to measure and see what have we done, how far are we? So give me a measuring stick. And then, so what's going to happen is Brando's going to kind of, he's going to, I'm going to measure like 12 centimeters from the camera, kind of at a slight angle, and I'm just going to push with my finger and see where we are. Okay, we're, we're really nice. Let's go 13, 13, 13, yeah. Okay, so let me have that there. 
So I've elbowed up a little bit, and then I'm going to measure about. Go on external. Let's go external view. Steve. Steve. I'm here. All right, so on the outside, I'm measuring from the camera to, to where we, you know, we did a little push here, and you can see where that's on the outside, so we've got plenty of space there. So I'm going to make, a, make our, our farthest anterior incision about 13 centimeters, and then my, basically my right hand here, uh, this would be arm number three, if you will, is going to be about six and a half centimeters, so I'm just making a mark there. And then, as I mentioned, one of the important uh, distances is, the, is between the most anterior arm, hold here, Brando. And then the assistant. So we're going to go about eight and a half here. And then I'm just going to push there. This is going to be 12. Let's just see, Terry. Look down a little bit, doctor. Oh, yeah. We're good. Maybe a little. Maybe we'll move a little stuff, lad. You don't need that much room, do you, Brandon? No. OK. OK, that's better. OK. So now Brandon's going to put ports in. Thank you, Terry. Go ahead. And these are eight millimeter robotic ports. Let's go back internal. Okay. It's pretty small, Brando. Is that good? Okay. Internal. Hold on, Brando. Wait, wait, wait one second for him. Okay, here we go. Go ahead, Brando. How's the image quality? Excellent. Perfect. Is anybody there? Can they hear me? We, we can hear you, but you can't hear us. How can we hear you? I don't know who I'm talking to. Talk to. Hello? Can we hear anybody? I didn't hear anybody. I just heard someone. Can you hear us now? Can you hear us now? Can you hear us now? Yeah. All right, good. How's the image, how's the image quality? It's fantastic. We're seeing everything. It's beautiful. All right, because I didn't hear any comments. I wasn't sure if you guys were at coffee or what was going on. All right, great. All right, so that's our course. Now we now our assistant. Do you guys have any questions? Yeah, there was a question. Actually, John had a question earlier. He said, is there any limit to how much you can pump up that balloon? You said in your lecture you do like 50, 60 pumps, but is there any limit? I've never had a balloon break. I guess that would be the limit, but I've never had one of those break. Um, but I've never, you know, I guess what I'm trying to do is to get all the folds out of it. I mean, the more you pump it up, the more, the more you know, space you gain, and, and the more the paradigm gets pushed off, and the more the, you just have a better space if you can. So. We try to max it out. I'm sure the manufacturer has a number, but. And this is your air seal port, right. correct? Yeah, this is air seal. So we're going we're gonna to go to air seal here. This is 12 millimeters. OK, air seal mode, please. And then we're going to run the pressure at, let's run the pressure at 10 today, OK? okay. okay. So we're going to run at 10 today. And that's the other nice thing about air seal. You can run at a low pressure. So now we're going to dock, and we're going to, we're going to switch scopes. We're going to go to the zero scope, and we're going to bring the robot in. So let's go external, Steve. And let's go with the, um, the, big, the big camera, the overhead camera, OK? We have a lot of cameras here, which is nice. We have the, uh, the uh, bedside camera, if you will, and then we have an overhead camera. So Jim, do you routinely use the zero for this case? Do you ever use 30 up, 30 down? Never. I've never. I, I mean, I, I think one time, I hate to say never on anything, but one time I actually had to use a 30 up lens because it was really a, a, lo, a, hard, a large hip, a very high hip. And I, we couldn't really, we were on the hip the whole case, and the way to get off the hip is to go 30 up. Is there anything wrong? worse, of course. Is there anything down, wrong with it? on the hip even more. So, so I'll so tell you. I, go ahead. Sorry, I was going to say I'll tell you what I do, and you can tell me that I'm wrong. But what I like to do is I do the majority of the case in 30 up. But then once in a while, I find it nice on the X side. You can switch 30 up, 30 down very easily. So, for example, when I do the hyalur dissection, I'm looking for the artery. Sometimes it's easier in 30 down than it is in 30 up. So I'll do most of the case in 30 up, and then use 30 down for the hyalur dissection. Is that okay? Am I doing anything wrong? No, I mean you got to do what works. I would, you know, I guess. That, whatever works for you is fine. I, I mean, I like the 30 lens. I, that's how I do my prostates now, exactly what you're doing. I, I don't use a zero at all for the prostates. Um, we go 30 up, 30 down, never have to do a zero. I drop the glider 30 up, and then do the rest of the case 30 down. And then the other thing about the prostates is that you can get underneath the pubic bone, and it works great. 
But if it works for you, that's fine. I mean, the fact that you're doing retro at all is a miracle. So I'm, whatever works. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm still getting used to it. I've only done about 30 cases retro, so I'm still getting used to it. But I want everybody to know here, because sometimes people question what's the value of coming to these courses, and can you really go home and do this stuff? And Jim, for years, was telling me, come out to Seattle. I'll show you how to do retro. You'll like it. You'll start doing it. And I just couldn't find the time to come and spend a couple days with him. So literally what I did is I just learned it from watching him do live cases, and you know there was a recording of one of these cases online that I watched and I saw where he puts his ports and then I just started doing it and it worked. First couple were a little rough, but after that, you know, it's smooth sailing. So you really can learn stuff at these courses, believe it or not, and then apply it in real life. It does work. You can do it. So don't be afraid of retro. You can do it. So we've got the robot in now and we're going to just rotate the boom around. So just like I told you, Jeff just put the X right on the camera port. So go ahead and rotate around, Jeff. So all he's going to do is just rotate the boom, basically not quite 180, but like 150. And we're going to have it facing, obviously, the direction we want to face. All I'm going to do is get the transverse line. You can't really see it here. Keep going, Jeff. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. And stop. Um, I wish we could show that. Bring that camera back in. Actually, the problem is going to be, yeah, just at an angle, just like that. Come on in. Come on in. Go ahead. Go ahead, Steve. Let's see the laser. Laser. And okay, great. Let's rotate that around. Just rotate it around so that they don't feel like they're upside down. Perfect. Okay. Let's see the laser. All right. So we've got the laser X on the on the camera, and all I did was rotate this horizontal line so it's pretty parallel to my one, two, three, four ports. That's it. And then he brings the arms down a little bit. Arms down. Keep coming. Keep coming. That's good, right there. And then we dock. That's. That's as easy as docking is. You know, I think targeting is a cool thing, but I don't use it. I feel I feel bad for the thousands of man hours that went into the software. And I think maybe limited. Yeah, targeting is here. we know it can be limited. You, you say that every time. But is there a way to get rid of that line? Because I never target, and I hear that thing every time. We should figure yeah. out if we can disable. But just think about all the engineering that went into targeting. You know, it's just it's really sad that we don't we don't target. So here's a, here's a little trick. So you've, you've docked, and this is a rule you know, I teach all my fellows. You've docked, you've moved the ports by definition. So now I, we bring the camera into the, let's go endoscopic view, please, endoscopic. So now we brought the camera into the assistant port, and now we can adjust our, our ports, as I talked about. That's a great idea. I'm going to start doing that. That's a great idea. Yeah. So, and this port especially, Roddy, you have to bring this back really far because it's very close to the kidney. And if you don't get it back far enough, you you don't have the mobility of the instrument. So I try to bring this back as far as possible. And then I'm going to bring it in closer. Now, this is the camera I was telling you about. Look right here, Brando. Camera here. So you see right here, I can I can actually bring this back a little bit and gain a little more field of view. So I'm going to make the adjustment on the outside, and I'm going to bring this back a tiny bit. And then I'll lock it there. So that just gave, I mean, that little bit is, is helpful. Okay, right here. So okay, this is as opposed uh, to what you would typically do is you'd put your camera in through your camera port, and then you can't really see your other ports, and you're kind of blindly trying to get your hands in. That's what I do because I didn't know you could do this. Now that I know, I'm going to do it. Yeah, it works great. I mean, these are the little things that make your life better because now you can watch the instruments come in on a direct vision scissor. Now everything's coming in on direct vision. And, you, and again, you're not, you're not worried about hitting anything. There's Solis. Brandon, let me back this up a little bit more. OK, now let's, let's look at you now. Fourth arm, fourth arm. Same thing with the fourth arm. He's going to back that up a tiny bit. Progress. All right, so here we are. You know. Okay, now, now we're going to go to the console. Okay, hot, hot. Yeah, forget about the black line. It doesn't mean anything. <clears throat> All right, so that's docking. Questions? Jim, so if you get a Jim, if you get a rent in the peritoneum when you're taking it down, what what are you doing at this stage? At this stage. Yeah, so I, if I get a rent, I get I normally get it. In the uh, when I'm when I'm pushing it off with the with the instruments, and if I get a rent there, like I said, I just make a giant hole. I just um, can you guys hear me? Okay. Yeah, yes. we can hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. I just make a giant hole, 
And then instead of putting my fourth arm, that most anterior port, if you will, right at the edge, I just put it kind of in the transperitoneal space. And I do that so that when I bring my, my progress in, I'm actually holding back the peritoneum and the kidney both. So it works well that way. All right, so let's clean the scope. We've got a dot on the right eye, please. Actually, we don't. That's fat. And that point about okay. the second black line on the ports, I was going to say, even for the trans cases, I, I rarely will go all the way to the second black line, just to create more space. So I don't pay attention to that at all. I'm sorry, Keaton, can you say that again? I didn't hear you. No, there, there was a question about, you know, the, the fulcrum of the port being that second black line, and how relevant is that? Oh, right, right. saying that in general, yeah, 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 we, exactly. stopped, uh, we stopped paying attention to that. So, <laughs> well, you're gonna not so gonna be able to talk in inches, then. Pull back the fourth arm a tiny bit. Fourth arm. This is that vessel I got early on. I'm gonna get it again. Perfect. Okay, perfect. Okay, so now, as we were talking about, this is the um, this is the fat outside your fascia right here. In this case, I'm going to show. We'll take it off. We don't really need to because I can just hold up on it like this. But I just want to show you what you can do um, if you have a lot of fat here. Now, of course, what we'd like to do is not enter the peritoneum when we do this. So, or or your fascia if we can avoid it. So. So everyone's kind of oriented, right? Gerotas is underneath. Right. So here's Solus. The patient's head is here. The patient's foot is here. One of the places I start is right here on the posterior body wall. I'm not going to get in Gerotas. I'm just going to push it off the sidewall. Because this case, if you think about it, you start with a very small space. And all you do during the case is make it bigger and bigger the whole time. So I go from the scope away from the scope the entire time, OK? <laughs> Yeah, the psoas is a, is a great landmark. If you ever get lost in the rich perineal space, just go look the, for the psoas. Look for the psoas, and it reorients you. Hold on, Brando. Yeah. All right, Brando. So we're going to have to push the, um, the posterior arm back in. We're, we're out a little bit. I'm having a little uh, resistance. So that means that we're probably too far out with that arm. One of the things that I'll mention too that's really helped me, because again, I'm a relative novice, I've only done about 30 of these. One of the things that I'll do very early in the case is I'll pop the ultrasound in. So at this stage, I might put the ultrasound in and just get a lay of the land. Where's the upper pole of the kidney? Sometimes you get fooled. Sometimes it's much lower or much higher than you thought. So I'll just put the ultrasound probe in, find the upper pole, find the lower pole, I know the hilum somewhere in between, and now I know where to start looking for my artery. I know Jim doesn't have to do that because he's very comfortable in this space, but um, there's less landmarks than what you're used to in transperitoneal. So that's one way that you can compensate is by using the ultrasound very early. Yeah, I think that's a great point. I, I mean, I think you can do that in any case. Trans, retro, if you're not sure where you are, the ultrasound is really nice. Of course, you got to know what you're looking at. So there is a learning curve with ultrasound. We, we don't talk much about it, but you know, you got to become used to looking at things. So all I'm doing is just going to leave that down there. That's going to make our space a little better, OK? So I've already kind of entered it, but here's Gerotas. So we call this entering the bag, so I'm just going to make this incision right here. And again, this is very safe. You stay right here, parallel the sauce muscle. The other thing is I'm going to curve this up. So you see the body walls like this. You can go that way, but I find if you curve it up, it gets out of your face, this, this cut edge here. This cut edge here is a very important landmark, especially if you've never done this operation, because if you stay inside this cut edge, this cut edge right here of Drew is the upper edge, that's going to keep you within the kidney. If you get outside of it and you're not sure where it is, that's when you get in the peritoneum. You'd like to avoid getting in the peritoneum. And as you go this direction, the peritoneum is going, going to come up here. We can take it to right about here probably, and then we just kind of have to say hello. So now what we do, and you can see kidney right there, we basically walk along the sauce muscle and then we start to see some landmarks, okay? There's an artery, there's cava. I'll show it to you better here in a second. But I know on the right side, the cava is gonna be right there. Also, if you really wanna find things and be, and be, a, and be a, you know, a complete surgeon, you can find the ureter. It's gonna be right in here and I'll show it for you, show it to you. This is kidney you're seeing right there. And you can see how quickly, you know, once you're in, this operation is, you know, you're, you're on things. 
You know, just a comment about the ureter. If you um, ever have to do a pyeloplasty on somebody who has a hostile abdomen, this is actually a nice way to do a pyeloplasty. I've done that a couple times just to avoid going into the peritoneal cavity, uh, and it's very doable. There's tumor right there, it appears. So you can see, I mean, that's why I wasn't worried about time because this case is, you know, it is what it is. No, it's great. We, we'd like to see, because you know, the majority of the audience hasn't done this before, so they're new to it, so we want a case that right. they would be able to start with. So well, it's yeah, exactly. I didn't, I, you know, I could have chose a, you yeah, know, we don't want a crazy, crazy case here. Yeah, yeah, we don't want a crazy those. case. We want something right. doable. Yeah. We and obviously that's true of, of your learning curve with any case. You're always going to start with the easier one. So when you start doing retros, do the same thing because if the access is going to be the hardest part for you when you're starting out, so if it takes you a long time to get the access and you're like really exhausted and now you've got like a really crazy tough tumor to do, uh, that's probably not a good combination. But if you start with an easy tumor, nice posterior, not too medial, the more medial the tumor, the more you've got to really lift that kidney up and you're going to be kind of working upside down. So you actually, it's better to have something that's kind of directly posterior rather than really posterior medial. So start with an easy one, and that way you can really focus on the getting the access, getting the port placement, and then the rest of it is easy. So there's your order. So you can see how easy a pyeloplasty would be there. You're right on renal pelvis now, uh, but just keep in mind that if you have a crossing vessel, it's going to be the opposite from what you're used to, transperineal. So you know, Ronnie, I, 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 I'm very fast out of retro, but I don't do my pyeloplasties retro for that very reason, in that suturing on the other side of the crossing vessel I found to be very difficult. So I did a few, and then I just went back to trans because... You know, it just was better for, this, for the anastomosis. Yeah, I agree with you. I've only done it a couple times, again, just to avoid a hostile abdomen. But usually you know from yeah. your scans pre-op whether or not you have a crossing vessel. You can usually see it on your CT. Uh-huh. So Jim is nicely so illustrating one of the major benefits of the retro approach, and that is that your artery is closer to you than the vein. So obviously when you're transperitoneal, you see the vein first and the artery is deeper. In this case, it's the opposite. So the artery is actually easier to get to. Brando, I got a conflict out, outside with the fourth and my right arm. Can we separate them a little bit? Let me, let me get off the tissues here, but I think we just need to push, we need to get a little separation there, okay? Hold on a second, let me get off the tissues. Give me a little more space there if you can, okay? Jim, where, where's your cut edge you made into Gerotis? Yeah, it's up here now. Right here, you see it? Yep. So it's way up there. It, it flew up, you know, when I released it. Are we good, Brando? No, 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 I don't need clearance. I don't need clearance. I just need the arm separated a little bit, okay? Actually, go ahead and give me clearance on the fourth. Go ahead, go ahead and give me that. So there's a function on these on the XI arms you guys need, might be familiar with, but it's very important. Right, right now. It's um, it's called clearance um, and reach. Those are the, that basically it's a combination of well one or the other. Reach allows you to go backwards. The arms kind of pull themselves out of their own way. Uh, it feels a little better. So see what the fourth arm is doing for him, how it's lifting up the kidney and pulling it away so that he can get to the hilum. That's what you don't have if you don't have the fourth arm in. You can do it, but that's what Jim was saying, is that when he was doing a three-arm approach with the SI robot, he would have to use one hand to push the kidney up, and now he's dissecting the hilum out with one hand. So it's doable, it's just not as nice as when you have the fourth arm and lift the kidney. We have a couple of still, still having conflict right now. Has, has anybody used the robotic suction? Uh, is the question. Forget it, forget it, forget it, forget it. Forget Anyone? Forget it. Robotic suction. Looks like nobody's using it. I don't use it. I tried it once when it looked cool and never used it after that. Yeah. I mean, it's just not dynamic enough, you know? You're used to like parallel dynamic movement and it goes against the normal flow. So I think you guys saw from the SIVA model that there was, there was an early bifurcation of the artery. I don't know if you appreciated that or not. Yeah, absolutely. But yeah. the SIVA model, I think, really showed that nicely. I think better than I, I saw it on the uh, scan for sure. So here's one branch. Here's the other branch. That means the main trunk's going to be down here. And interestingly, I don't know if you noticed in the model, but it looked like the branch was behind the cava. That's not a problem retroperitoneally. Although transperitoneally, it is a problem because 
I mean, you can you can work and get behind the cava, but right here, it's in your face. I mean, you don't have to worry. You're, you're behind the cava, kind of by definition. Yeah, I think if anything, if you're doing a retroperitoneal, the hardest thing probably would be the venous dissection and clamping the vein. Now again, yeah, most people I, never, I think I nowadays, it, yeah, exactly. That's so I think nowadays benefit. people don't really clamp the vein, so it's not a problem. But if you're used to clamping the vein, you're gonna have a harder time doing it retroperitoneal. Yeah. But for some reason you don't have to, Ronnie. I don't know why. Oh, I know. I'm you just saying for those who do. Retro. Jim, what, what clinical criteria do you use to uh, order the uh, SIVRA imaging? Is there a certain nephrometry score? Or... I'm sorry, I didn't hear the question. Nephrometry score for criteria for what? Yeah, Tim was asking, when do you order the SIVRA? When do you get the SIVRA pre-op? Are there any criteria, like nephrometry score or anything you use? Or do you always well, get it? Um, we've been doing it as part of a study, actually. We, we did a randomized study looking at we randomized patients with and without to see if it impacted what we were doing surgically, and indeed it does. So for a while we've been doing it on everybody, um, but um, I would say, um, you know, you, the problem is you don't know what you're missing sometimes. So I would say if I was going to use it, I'd probably be using it on everyone. I wouldn't necessarily do it based on on nephrometry, I would probably do it on everyone just to make sure I wasn't missing something. So that's the main artery right there. That's before the bifurcation. And of course, this is cave here, so we're behind it. So we've got a we got a great view of it. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, Brenda. So I'm just going to dissect this out. I don't have to. I've got everything I need right now. So my next step would be ultrasound routinely. As soon as I get the Highland. I do two things. We talk about fluid and where they are with their fluid, and then we talk about, we bring the ultrasound in, every case. I'm just gonna see, there's, there's a vein going along here, kind of a weird, kind of posterior vein branch. I think you should just ignore it. It's kind of weird, but... We, don't, we, we know what it is, so I'm okay with it. Okay. All right, so let's bring in ultrasound, Brando. How much fluid, Mimi? Go ahead and get 20 Lasix, please. So, Jim, I'm going to ask you a question because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to troubleshoot all the things I have problems with and, and help you, you know, have you help me be better at this. One of the challenges that I have with this is that I always find that because there's such a long, rigid portion of the ultrasound, that sometimes I can't get enough clearance and I really feel like I'm fighting the ultrasound probe to get it where I want it. Do you have any tricks for that? Do you need to pull your port back? Well, a lot of it depends on where you put your assistant because this is coming through my assistant port. Um, so if your assistant's close, then you can have that problem because you're right, there's a very long, rigid portion of that. Um, so, you know, we put the port, we put the ultrasound back pretty far. Can I, can I increase the gain? Can we get 58 or 60 on the gain, please? It looks a little dark. Let's go, let's go brighter on the gain. 58 goes 60? 60. Perfect, okay. So here's the tumor, clearly. This is really a nice tumor in the world of tumors. And it's towards the upper pole. So what I look for with ultrasound is the depth, where it is, and, and also I'm starting to get a sense of my margins. But I mean, I can see this tumor, but if I had a big fat guy with toxic fat, I would be doing the ultrasound just to find out where I should go because I don't want to get into the tumor as I'm going through the fat. So I do the ultrasound very early in those patients just, be, just so I know exactly where things are. Okay, I'll send out. Jim, have you found that there tends to be less fat on the back side of the kidney than the front side? Um, I don't know. That's a good question. I haven't really noticed that, but that's a, I don't. I'm not so sure to be honest. But maybe we should study that. Yeah, it seems to it like me. Yeah, go ahead. Let's study it. I can do everything. Oh, uh, so Jim, a question from the audience. Any comments on the BK or the Aloka? Are you using a BK here, and do you have a preference yeah. between the two? BK, yeah. Uh, I think they're both nice. Um, I like the BK because I like 
the fin at the tip. I think what you get is a better contact. I'll show that when we get in. But um, when you have the fin being held by the tip of the ProGrasp, and then you also have the back of the ProGrasp pushing down on the, um, on the back of the probe, and I think you just get a better contact. So that's why I like that one. So this fat is not stick to, sticking to the tumor. So you could argue, oh, you know, what are you going to do about this fat? Should we take it off separately? Should we leave it on? In my experience, if this fat comes off like that, that's not T3 disease. So I don't worry about it. Yeah, that looks like an oncocytoma anyway. It does. I don't think so. I'm messing with you. <laughs> I, think this is renal, I think this is renal cell carcinoma from what I can tell. The one, the one advantage, Ronnie, to the Aloka, although I use BK, but the one advantage is because you're holding the fin from the back, you don't have that same clearance issue. Yeah, so you can kind of half be in and still use it much better than the, than the BK. But I, I agree so just, with the contact. Just for the, sake of full, okay. yeah, just for the sake of full disclosure, we did offer this patient um, real mass biopsy, and she, you know, declined. She wants it out. So we did talk about it. We talked about the potential benefit. Um, and so she, uh, she said, no, I just want you to get it out of me. I don't, I don't want this tumor. I don't, want, I don't want more imaging. I want it out. Ronnie biopsies all of his tumors. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm going to talk about biopsy later today. I, I would agree. Yeah. I think she's a relatively young patient, it looks like. So, you know, you're going to give her a lifetime of surveillance and scans and whatever uh, versus just plucking it out of there. It's an it's a easy partial. The complication rate is low. Her postoperative morbidity is going to be minimal. So I, I would agree. I think this would be one just to go straight to partial nephrectomy. Where's your uh, bovian bipolar set at, Jen? What settings do you like? Settings on the what? Your cautery. Cautery settings? Uh, yeah, so, okay, that's a really interesting topic. Um, because we're using the Herbe, um, you know, there's been a big kind of, I don't know, shift, you know, if you're going from Valley Lab to Herbe. So recently, Intuitive created a software update where there's another um, option. So the options that I used to use, there's, so for coag, for monopolar coag, there was force and swift uh, were the two modes. And force created just a lot of smoke and to me was just a little too, too aggressive. Swift was good, but it wasn't very efficient. There's a new uh, mode they just come out with called Classic, which is supposed to be closer to what we're used to in North America, and I like it. Uh, it, it seems a lot like um, the Valley Lab, and there's less smoke, it's more efficient. But, um, so I'm using Classic, as I get in that vessel, I'm just gonna look down and see what I'm using. I think I'm using, um, I'm using Classic 40 watts, and uh, then on my bipolar, I'm using uh, soft coag, 80 watts, auto stop off. I don't use any cut. I never use cutting current. So, um, so that's what I'm using. I'm, I'm using uh, classic 40 watt. And there's a, there's a, the, um, the effect is one. You have two choices on the classic. You have one and two, and I'm using the lower setting. This is different. Has anybody else had the has software up the there? Has anybody had an opportunity to use it? Yeah, we just switched. That's what I was saying. If you haven't switched, then it's the one, two, three, four on the XI. Um, but the but the software upgrade now you have a whole different metric to go by. So I just started using Classic, but I agree, I like it better. I had a lot of is issues with with the Herbe. So Jim, do you routinely clean off this much of the kidney, or are you just trying to make it look pretty for us? No, I'm just I'm just making sure we can see, and and um, I am going to rotate it a little bit because you can see we need to see this side. This this tumor is kind of upper pole lateral. It's not it's true posterior. Um, but you know, I mean, if I I could take this tumor out right now, and you know, we'd be done. But I'm going to just make sure we have good. Good exposure here. I'm going to rotate this tumor a little bit towards me. 
Yeah, I think that's a good point, actually, and this is, applies equally to transperineal and retroperineal. It's not unique to retroperineal, but the idea is that, you know, when you are ready to cut your tumor out, you want that tumor to be in the ideal location so that you can see every surface of it. You don't want to cut any corners, in other words, and just be like, all right, I see the tumor, we'll figure it out, I'll just cut it out, start sewing. If you can't see the far edge and you cut that tumor out, you're not going to be able to see where you need to sew. So that's why I think that step, that extra step that Jim just did, just to rotate the kidney to be able to see the far side better, that's going to make it so much easier for him when he goes to cut this out and sew it back together. Go ahead. So we're going to bring the ultrasound back in. Jim, while you're doing that, wouldn't you decide to leave some fat on the tumor uh, versus send some fat overlying tumor as a specimen? What's your thinking of that? Um, so you're asking me or are you asking the panel? Both. That's John asking. Yeah, I mean, if it stays on, I'll leave it on, but... If I tried to use that fat as a handle, it wouldn't be much of a handle. It was ready to come off. So, so yeah, I, I leave it on if I can. It, it, it can be useful. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to um, use this ultrasound. So the tip of the ultrasound probe corresponds to the left side of the ultrasound view. So I'm going to pull the probe back until the tumor touches the left side of the view, which is right there. That tells me where the tumor is. So I can make a mark right there. So that's my my cephalad extent of the tumor. I'm going to give myself a couple millimeters more. So I think there are some people who are tempted to want to have like 0.5 millimeter margin or something really tiny. Um, and I would discourage you from doing that, particularly if you're not a super experienced surgeon and you're just doing you know, a few of these a month or a year. And the reason why is because the, the, the biggest priority in this specific patient right now is a negative heart. She's relatively young. She's going to live for another 30, 40 years. She doesn't want even a much more positive margin. She wants a negative margin. So saving an extra 5,000 nephrons is not going to make a difference to her long term. So just get a negative right. margin. You don't have to be right on the tumor. Some people would even try to enucleate this tumor. I wouldn't do that. I want to get a negative margin, like a visibly grossly negative margin. Uh, so I don't really try to gild the lily and get these tiny margins. When I was at OSU, it was interesting. Our pathologist there, our GU pathologist, just did an interesting study. She looked at these tumors that we had taken out and she looked at the kidney tissue around the tumor. And for the first five, six millimeters of kidney, it's useless anyway. It's all hyalinized. There's no glomeruli still there. It's all been crushed by the tumor growth. So the first five, six millimeters around the tumor is useless kidney anyway. So I don't see really why you're enucleating. Maybe it's less bleeding is why people do it. But really, you're not saving functional kidney anyway. So just get a grossly negative margin. So here's my first mark. I made a mark down here with the ultrasound so I can just connect those two. And again, I agree with Ronnie. I think you can, you know, cancer control is really what this operation's about. And uh, so I, I, I do enucleations in certain cases. There's no question. And some of those cases are tumors that are right on the hilum. And you have to enucleate. But in general, when you have a peripheral tumor like this, um, you know, it's, so again, I'm gonna pull back. So the tumor is meeting us right about, right about there, tumor is right there. So I'm gonna get a little farther away. So, Jim, question from the audience while you're doing that. Uh, Post-ablation partial, so salvage partial, what are the challenges with that? Uh, you mean after ablation? Yes. Yes. Uh, well, very stuck, very, you know, uh, and then, you know, we've done partials after somebody's already been in there doing a partial with for positive margins. And... Um, I tend to go, you know, you obviously you want to get a negative margin the second time around, so we tend to go wider and we try and spare what we can, but in general we don't, we're not there to um, try and spare kidney, and of course the wider you go, you get a little farther away from the reaction, and so that makes things a little more doable as well. So we tend to go a bit wider on these redo surgeries. 
One of the unique challenges in that scenario that at least what I've struggled with is, yeah, I mean, there's some reaction, there's some toxic fat, but that's all manageable. The problem is if it's a recurrence that's within the bed, the ultrasound view of it is all distorted, right? The kidney base doesn't look normal. You can't tell where that recurrence is. I mean, it's really an unusual foreign looking ultrasound image. So just figuring out how much to take, which is usually more than you probably need to, is what ends up happening. That's what Jim's saying. But it really looks messed up when you, when you do that intra-op ultrasound. So what I'm looking for now is just the depth. So I've got my, I've got it marked out, and it looks like it's medullary. It doesn't look like it's, it goes very deep. So it looks like I want to get down about a scissor and a half depth all the way around and then come across the bottom. Okay, ultrasound out. That's a nice metric, scissor and a half. Is that, is that, yeah, that's is that the Canadian metric system, scissor and a half? Scissor and a half, yeah, it's Canadian. We're very close to Canada here. But I think that's kind of where we, you know, scissors about, most cortex, most cortices are about two centimeters. This, this program, the, uh, the um, hot shears are a centimeter. The metal portion's a centimeter. So a centimeter has about 15 millimeters. So another thing okay, that I'll do so is... Okay, so I think we're ready to go here. Let's have, um, let's have bulldog, a medium bulldog, and a uh, bolster. So another thing that you can use to figure out how deep you need to cut is to have an idea of how much, what is your proportion of exophytic versus endophytic. So if you know from your CT scan, for example, that it's 50-50, then the same thing staring at you here is how deep you need to go. If it's more exo than endo on the CT, then you don't have to cut as deep as what's sticking out. So it's just kind of a general idea that you can use to figure out how deep to cut as well. It's retro, though. You're not going to lose it. If it was transparent, you yeah, know, I'm sure he would tie a suture on it. All right, so... There's our scanlin. Are you having a hard time, Brando? No, 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 no. Okay, I'm just testing. We're not doing anything yet, Brando. Don't worry. We're gonna do our we're gonna do our debrief. Okay, so um, so what we do is we kind of inform everybody about what we're gonna do. Here we're gonna um, clamp the kidney. Now, normally, after I clamp the kidney, I would give between a half and one cc of ICG just to confirm that I have complete ischemia. That's how I use ICG in most cases. If I'm not doing selective clamping, I want to confirm that I have not missed a vessel. And I think it's a great way to use ICG because you, you know there are those cases, especially on the right side where you miss an upper pole vessel and you're regretting it because you're, you, know, you don't have complete vascular control. So we give ICG, make sure there's no grain in the kidney, we cut, 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 with the plan that we talked about, and then I bag the specimen immediately, so we have a bag available, right, Terry? Yes. And then we throw the bag in the lower retroperitoneum, and then I go to needle drivers, and then I do my suturing. So my monography is different than Ronnie's, which is different than Caden's, which is different than everybody's. Everybody's got their own monography, it seems like. Everybody cuts tumors out pretty much the same, although, you know, you could argue a nucleation, but... I think Renorphy is um, kind of dealer's choice, and what I do is usually this kind of three-layer repair. Now, it depends on the size of the defect. I do individual vessels and collecting system with, with a 4 vicro. I do I run the base with kind of a running monofilament, and the purpose of that is not so much to get vessels, but to bring the, to decrease the dead space, to bring the base together so you don't have this dead space. And then I do the outer layer with uh, kind of a classic sliding clip Renorphy. Um, with two ovicro and then you know hemolox on each side. Um, I'll do early on clamping in most cases. I mean, if, if the warm ischemia time is like nine minutes or whatever, you know, I'll just continue the case. You know, there's no point in doing early on clamping because in general, I, I get all the, the, the vessels. I mean, I would say not in general, but I get the I get all the vessels with my individual sutures. 
So I'll do it early on clamping in most cases, but if it's, if it's a short one, a skinny time, it doesn't matter, then I just, I just finish it. Um, so that's my plan. Um, the one thing we're going to check, and I know Ronnie probably, did Ronnie show his um, veterinary medicine surgery that yes, he does with the large needles? Yes, of course. Yes, of course. Yeah, the, the needles that you actually have to bring through the, the human body because they're so large, did he show those? No, not for this one, not for this one. But uh, they loved it, Jim. They, they're all ready to do it. I, I think they're being kind. Okay, now the other thing I want to check is the ports. You see how this port's almost all the way out? We're going to be exchanging instruments in there, so now we want to bring this port in, Brando, okay? This is something you want to check before warm ischemia. Go ahead. In, 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 and back, in, in some more, Brando. In some more, and then back it up. Burp it, burp it, burp it, burp it up, burp it, good, right there. Okay, let's go to the posterior, whoa. Well, the forearm we're not going to exchange, but if you want to do that, yeah, let's do that, might as well. Okay, back it up a little bit. Back it up, Brando. Yeah, okay. We're not going to exchange it, which is good news. And then this was this one posteriorly is the one that we've got to be aware of. Yeah, that one's, that one's out. So let's bring that in. Go ahead. In, 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 in. Go ahead. There you go. And back, so you can see the critical back, nature of this kind of checklist. Perfect. It's, uh, you know, all of these checks that he's doing. For me, we actually go through the process of putting the needle drivers in. So we make sure that the needle drivers have lives. You know, that's another part of our checklist. Yeah. We've checked our needles as well. Let's have, a, let's clean the scope. We got our left eye out. Oops, that port's out too. Yeah, I mean, I, I think having this <coughs> pre-ischemia checklist is important. I mean, there are people who actually put something on the wall. Uh, unless you work with the exact same team every time and everyone knows exactly what you're doing, which is a real luxury, um, you ought to have something written down that everyone can follow. And that's how your stitches are, what stitches are, how long they are, the instruments, the, the needle driver. I mean, we don't, I, I only use the scissor to a needle driver and back, right? I mean, that's probably the only change that tends to happen regularly on these anymore. Um, I guess some people could change their left arm too, but that, that bipolar can suture with, so I, don't, I doubt that there's any other switches that happen. But if you use flow seal, right, if you use, um, you know, whatever, you, next thing you know they don't have it and you want to put it in the defect, so these checklists are important. Do you all think that there's any clinically relevant loss of compressive force in these nice by dogs over time or a non-issue? Yeah, if people have studied that, they've looked at it. So the question was whether the bulldogs lose compressive force over time, and they actually do. And you know, keep in mind too that usually you're using the tip of the bulldog, which is going to be the least compressive portion of it. So over time, they can lose compressive force. And you know, for me, honestly, it doesn't bother me because I don't mind if I see a little bit of arterial bleeder, bleeding, but it's not completely compressed, because actually that helps me find the arteries, and then I go bipolar them. So I don't mind if it's not compressing completely, but if you really want a bloodless field, then you may want to have your bulldogs checked periodically and, and you know, get newer ones if they're getting loose. Or you could put two on, yeah. Okay. Is that what you do? You put two on? Just put two on the artery. Which bulldog is he using? So, uh, so um, I, have to, I have to comment that we recently, um, you know, Scanlon has just created a bulldog tester, a mobile bulldog tester. And we actually just had our bulldogs tested before this meeting. And they can bring it in and they can test your bulldogs to see, you know, what the closing force is. And I think it's a great idea because you just don't know how, you know, how much use you're getting and how, how they're being processed. There's a lot of variables that influence how those bulldogs work. So I think it's a great idea. Anybody using management? Any questions? We're gonna before we go. Any, do you, any thoughts? Anything you using uh, comments? Uh, you giving anything pre ischemia like mannitol or any other consideration? I heard six. I heard Lasix. Uh, Lasix. Mannitol anymore? We we were told by our, our nephrologist that it may have you know problems. I again now the reason we're not giving ICG in her is she's got a contrast allergies which we didn't know about till this morning. So she got a CT scan with contrast and all of a sudden. We, just, we, we, we now have a contrast allergy, so I don't know what's going on, but we're not going to give her the ICG. But is the ICG contrast is not a contraindication. It anymore. is. It's, it it's is. shellfish, no? Yeah. It's a shellfish allergy. Contrast allergy. They say IV dye allergy. You shouldn't use it. Yeah. I've done it. But. ICG yeah. is iodine. 
So we can't give it to her. Yeah. Anyway. Always unclear. Any questions? We're going to clamp. Go for it. And go. Any thoughts? Uh, like we're praying for you. We're praying for you. Go. Go. go for it. We're waiting. Do it. Very really good. All right. <laughs> He's missing. What is the fourth arm? You okay? Oh, I can move it. I can move it, Brando. You, you fine? You good? So I'm making sure Brandon's happy because he's going to give me exposure. Your so pressure is at six? It's just releasing. Or ten? You said your pressure's at ten? Ten. So notice how he made a wide capsulotomy incision to begin. You don't want to ever work in a hole. The capsule is what's going to hold your tumor from moving. So if you don't make that incision wide enough, you don't get the mobility on the tumor to get under it. So that's why he made that incision wide right at the beginning, and now he's getting under it. You never want to work in a hole. This, uh, you know, the gross specimen of a tumor like this should be a flying saucer, basically. So you got the ring around the middle, <clears throat> and then you can get close to the base. No. I don't give anything. Yeah, I don't give anything. Jim, I, I don't Jim gave Lasix on this he case. Gave. Yeah, I don't, I don't ever, no. I mean, there's been some good data recently that basically debunked it. I think if the patient is relatively dehydrated, which a lot of these patients are when they come in for surgery because they've been NPO after midnight, whatever, if you give them Lasix, I don't want to give Lasix to a dehydrated patient. So my routine is just to ask anesthesia just to give them a ton of fluids. To me, that's just as good. There's actually an interesting study, and I'll talk about it a little bit, but in JAMA that came out, not for partial, but for acute kidney injury, that LR is better than saline and it's renal protective. So there might be something there, but mannitol, I don't know anyone really that's routinely doing it anymore. So notice how he flipped his scissors over when he got to the deepest portion, he went curve up. So that was how he was going to try to make the turn to start going up now. See how he's flipping it, and then he'll start taking the curve up. So this is just a nice example about how Jim's mind, because he's done so many of these, he's already kind of thought about the 3D nature of the tumor. And he's got a 3D picture in his mind of where the tumor is and how deep he needs to go and when he needs to start coming up. So this is a beautiful example. The other nice move he's doing, and you don't pick up on it, is he's kind of doing this brush, this blunt brush with the tip of the scissor. So as you come around the back turn of the tumor, if you're not sure if there's more, if you just brush it, stroke it with the tip of the scissor, you know, the parenchyma will lead you at the right place. Instead of taking blind cuts in the back, you could get into the tumor that way. Short, short, Brando. You do that, Jim. Got it. Kind of, kind of a salvage, but not really. Okay. Let's go needle drivers. And maybe we'll clean the scope because we're, you know, time's fine. We, we're, not, we're, not, it's not an issue. We got a perfect picture. How's your, you, how's don't, your view? You know, we're perfect. We're good. We have no smudge. Caden and John. It's great. Perfect for us. Okay. We have a little smudge on the. Um, let me just see. Uh, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead and clean. Go ahead and clean, Brando, real quick. My left eye is not great. Yeah, go ahead and drop that. Go ahead. Go ahead and clean. Yep, perfect. Yeah, that's all right. That's the danger of cleaning. Should have put that in a little bit more. I thought we did. That's all right. Perfect, Brando. Okay, good. All right, so I'm going to do my normal look for vessels. Go ahead, Brando. So we got a vessel right here with a sinus. Fourth arm. All right, let me let me just come off a little bit. Is that better? Is that better? Was this a suction fourth arm external collision? 
I'm sorry, Caden? <clears throat> what, what was the collision? What was the collision? Uh, uh, externally, good question. Externally, Brandon was being kind of like I told you that sometimes that fourth arm can be a problem and it can create um, you know, a handcuff situation where he couldn't move. He couldn't really help me suck that much. Mm. So you brought it down inside, which brings it up outside. Outside. So now I'm going to just kind of do what people do with the, the, the V-lock. I'm just going to run it across the vessel. Suck, please. And there's not a lot of big things here. Uh, it does not look like a suture cut now. But you know, these 3-0, 2-0 can just break. Um, but it, I don't see the cut part of this. So I don't think this is suture cut. Is, Jim, is this a suture cut needle driver in your right hand? Yeah, it is. Yeah, that was wrong. It is. Good pick up. I don't think it's ne I like it. I don't think it's necessary. You can break. I mean, yeah. I don't like to, to break these small sutures that are um, <clears throat> kind of uh, it just it's just a little more traumatic than I like. So um, I like the suture cut for that. So I started. I learned how to use it on the prostates. And then, because I thought it would, make, it would help me a lot on the partials, because I just didn't like bringing scissors in, as well as, got a little vessel here. Definitely an artery right there. You can see that, you guys can see that artery right there? Yes, absolutely. Beautiful. That's, that's the one right there that's going to give us trouble if we don't get it, so. Give me another stitch, another, give me another short, please. And, th and this is kind of um, similar concept to what Ronnie talks about. Um, where I yeah, kind of run, so right here, there's a little vessel right here, please. And there's one I cauterized right there, so I'm going to go get that. But if you think of this defect as like an oval in the middle, you, you, you basically are running on each side of the oval. I, I think Ronnie makes that point clear in his talks. And that's kind of what I do with these sutures as well. I just, I mean, you could do this with V-Lock. I used V-Lock for a while. I just didn't like the characteristic, characteristics of it in the tissues, and maybe I was pulling too hard. I, the other thing is I was using V-Lock and not Quill or, or the um, Stratifix, which is, I think, a little less aggressive as far as the barbs. Well, Jim, um, I'll, I'll, I'll agree with ahead. you that if you're individually suturing vessels and you're tying down knots, the barb sutures are really not very good because the knots are thick and it's, it's, it's definitely not a feel for that. If you're running from outside parenchyma through the inside back to the outside as I do and it looks like Ronnie does, then it becomes less of an issue. So if, you're, if I was doing what you're doing, I wouldn't use the V-lock either. Well, I wasn't doing individual vessels with the V-lock. I was doing like the, the whip stitch that you classically see. I just didn't like the um, I didn't like the way it worked. It does saw more. That's the thing about the the V-lock. It because it yeah. has the barbs that stick out. It's going to saw more. Right, give me the short. Give me the short monocle. We'll show them the monocle. Or we could probably come off here. Actually, let's let's come off. Take this. Take this. Give me another Vico. We're just going to do something different today. Slightly different. But we're going to come off early. What time is our warm skinny right now? Okay. What is it? Eight minutes. Eight minutes. Is this 3-0 or 4-0? 4-0. This is 4-0. All right, so we're going to come off, and we're going to look for arteries. Let's see what we got. Now we could probably get a lot of this. There's, there's nothing really, but it's kind of a, an ooze here. <clears throat> and the ooze you could probably get with the, the Renorophy stitch. The reason I like to close the capsule is that I, I always worry that if I don't get every vessel, then I've got the capsule that could be open and causing a problem. So I like to close it. But this amount of bleeding, if, if we had just gone to our, our second layer, we probably wouldn't have even noticed this. Yeah, this is venous, really. This is not, uh, yeah. there's no pumpers in and there. This is not bad. There's something at the base there, which we're going to get. But... Yeah, 
know, there's something right there. Give me a little irrigation, Brando. Irrigate right there. Yeah, right there. A little, a little flush right there. Okay, there it is. I mean, these are actually those little arcuate arteries right here, these things right here. I mean, you can spend all day doing these, but I think what we're going to do, I'm going to do this last vessel, and then we're going to do our, our, normal, our normal closure. There are small little arteries here that, you know, they're going to bleed no matter what. We're good, Brando. Let's get a small monocle, please. So we're off ischemia time, so we can just, and you can kind of see there's a natural way this wants to close. It wants to close cephalad to caudal. So I'm gonna close the dead space here a little bit with this, this layer. This looks like an SH needle, Leo. It is. It is, Caden. Okay, so now I'm going to sequentially take the, uh, the slack out. Watch what happens to the base here. You see? Yeah, that's nice. And it's nice. going to get even tighter when I pull this, when I pull on each end. Yeah. So this is almost like a three-layer closure. You did your deep stitches. Now this is just closing dead space, and then you're going to do the capsule, right? Right. right. That's nice. That's nice. So we'll pull on that side, and then you can pull on this side because it's monofilament. Okay, let me, now let's have um, singles. So obviously when you have a defect like this, you don't want to start here, you want to start on the back side, because this is going to be the hardest stitch. If you, close the, if you close the front, then you're going to have problems. And notice I'm going to close this from left to right, and that's on purpose. And the reason for that is that my assistant is going to try and place Hemolox for me. Is that a 2-0? Oh? This is a 2-0 oh on a... What size is this needle, Terry? CT, what is this one? SH. Yeah, we're, we're, we're the small needle club. We're actually the opposite of you, right? <laughs> you know what they say, big needle, big. But here's, here's, the, here's the reality. In this small space, you know what, you know what an X, whatever that thing you use is, the X1 caliber needle is? It, it's huge here. So. Yeah, this so one, this one you common thing. So we've yeah. got this discrepancy here, right? So how are we going to correct that? Well, I'm going to go a little more superficial on this side, and then I'm going to go pretty deep on this side to bring that down. So I'm going to go way down in here. I'm not going to go very far. I'm just going to come straight up. Oh, get back here. All I have to do is my, my, my angle's not very good. And that'll bring that down, hopefully. Question is any role for he one? <clears throat> any role for hemostatic agents at this point, Jim? No, I don't. I don't think they do anything. Uh, well, first of all, they do something, but I don't think they're going to stop the kind of bleeding that you're worried about, which is arterial bleeding. I think they're good for cortical ooze, but other than that, you know, I think I don't think they're going to do much. Yeah, so I, I agree with you, except that before I do this, I do put a little layer of flow seal in there because it'll stop the cortical oozing. So it'll compress, you'll close it. <clears throat> For Ronnie's technique, where it's kind of open at the end, it doesn't matter. Then you can do whatever you want. But if you're going to close it like this, um, yeah, I put a little sliver in there. Just 
problem is if you put too much, it overflows and then it obscures everything. And so really just a little teeny tiny bit. <clears throat> Yeah, I, I don't think there's really any good evidence that these hemostatic agents make a difference. There's, you know, I don't think anybody's no. really done any level one studies or anything. So I think it's just dealer's choice. It's whatever you feel comfortable with. You know, I think cost, it's important to be uh, cognizant of cost and trying to keep your cost down. But if you're somebody who does like a dozen hormones a year or, you know, maybe 20 a year or, you know, relatively low volume, then really your priority is just good outcomes. Your, co you know, cost is not going to be the number one priority for you. If you're doing like 100 or 200 a year, then obviously these things add up, uh, but then you're probably not somebody who needs those extra agents. Uh, 4 was the first layer, 3 was the second layer, and yeah. I, I wouldn't remember any of it because, you know, everybody's got their own minority, fee, so I, I, I'm not sure this is reproducible. I think everybody's got to find what they like. I think it, it all, it, it, there's some basic principles that you want to try to adhere to, but um, I think the, the, the key is, I mean, the first layer to me, the, the, the four layers, that's, that's the one that does the most good in my world. Um, <coughs> yeah, let's go Lapitite, Brando. We don't have to overdo this. You can see we have pretty good hemostasis, so. But if you have bleeding, I, the reason I like these individual sutures is you can adjust them individually as far as tension. So I know, I, I, I know there's, you know, you can, sometimes you do this for norophy and then you get something kind of welling up. And I've been able to really kind of stop that just by, um, you know, adjusting the tension on these. Jim, question question out here is, um, can you have any comments on running versus interrupted capsular sutures? Yeah, I was just kind of addressing that actually. Um, the running suture, I think, is a little harder to adjust the individual tension. So if yeah. I had a bleeder right here, I could actually adjust that. Uh, hemo, uh, lapatite, please. So I could actually adjust that. But I think when you have a, a running suture, it's just a bit more of a challenge to adjust. Yeah, agree. You know, the other interesting thing we've been looking at is, you know, you can crank down on this uh, closure like you're saying with your giant needle club. Uh, one of the cool things you can do with ICG that, again, we're doing it to quantify it, is you can see what perfusion you have to that area of the renorphy. Exactly. Um, yeah, so and if, I, if you... We routinely test that at the end yeah. of the I think it's a good idea. <laughs> And so as we're learning, uh, you can actually affect global volume loss over time with how, how much of that extra tension you put on. And so there, there's definitely a balance between how hard you crank down and how much kidney you're actually saving in the long run. Uh, I think I mean, that's good for research purposes, but honestly, for the guy that's out there in the trench no, doing but, robotic no, partials. But, but right now... I mean, saving an extra 1% of kidney versus cranking the hell out of it and making sure it doesn't bleed post-op, I would choose the latter. So what happens is right now it looks good, right? There's no bleeding. You give IC green, there's good perfusion. It'll prevent you from wanting to crank down more, right? I mean, that's what I'm saying. So there is a practical purpose to this. I would still crank down. That's what I'm saying. You would still, I, would, I know I would you still would still crank, crank down. down. My I'm priority, just, again, is yeah, you not don't saving have an extra 1%. <laughs> I'm just trying to, you know, make sure the patient doesn't have a complication. So again, for research purposes, if you're in an academic center where you're measuring every percent of kidney that you're saving and you're doing renal scans before and after and all these things, then I think, you know, every nephron counts. But, you know, for me, again, just being the guy in the trenches, you know, community practice and, um, you know, again, just trying to get good outcomes for the patients, I, I really am not concentrating that much on every last nephron in terms of the margin or, you know, how hard I crank on the stitches. But again, each person, you know, do what you think is best. All right, well, um, what we're going to do is we're going to, I am going to put a drain in. I put them in retroperitoneal. I don't always put them in trans, but it's a small space. And they just get, sometimes they just get ecchymosis. It's just blood that pools in there. But we found the drain just kind of gets rid of that. So people ask less questions about what's going on with my side. I don't think we need a drain. I don't think there's going to be much here. But if there is any blood, it just tends to stay in the space because it's a small space. And then it comes out to the skin. So we've gone back to a drain um, after many years of not doing it. 
Um, a couple cases always change your mind. So, but uh, we'll put a drone in, extract the specimen. So what I will do with the pathologist, and we might be able to show you this later, I seal section the, the tumor with the pathologist just to look at the deep, deep margin. And I do that for a couple reasons. First of all, we, there's no discrepancy or concerns about getting surprise on the final pathology. If, if they call a negative margin here, it's, I, I've never really had anybody say, oh, you know, you've got a positive margin. So we go over it together. And we also get to inform our pathologists, and my pathologists are pretty experienced now. They're aware of the pseudocapsule. They're aware that that's not a positive margin. Um, so that's something that's helpful. The other reason we do it is for my learning and for my fellows' learning. We go from this procedure, and then we see how much we've taken, and we determine, did we take the right amount? Did we take too much? Did we take too little? You know, and so it allows you to kind of fine tune your technique by looking at your margin, because you just don't really know until you look at it how much you've actually taken. So you don't keep the patient asleep during that time in case you need to go and take more, do you? No, I don't, because I, I looked at the margin grossly. I'm, I'm fine with it. I didn't get into the tumor. I think we know that just from our view. Go ahead, Brando. I think we know that just from our view, um, and we don't we don't keep the people patient asleep for that. Go ahead and take it out, Brando. Are you good? Yeah, yeah. Take the port out. You're good. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Any questions? That was beautiful. Any any questions to finish out the live case? All right. How about a hand of a uh, round of applause for Dr. Porter? Thank you. Nice work. Okay, so um, you guys can continue the program. I'll be over there soon, and we will um, continue the lectures. Awesome. Thanks, Jim. Awesome.